with our next uh, presentation. Um, we've got a great presentation for you guys uh, today. And my colleagues, Joe Stam and Kari, are going to talk to you about uh, mobile computing, uh, mobile computer vision with Tegra. So that's it. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Apologize again for the slight delay in getting started. I uh, lost my display adapter here. So I'll uh, try to make up for that uh, lost time in the talk here. Um, so yeah, my name is Joe Stam. I lead a team at uh, NVIDIA focused on mobile computer vision applications. Um, and just to tell you a little bit what that is, um, like I said, we're focused on mobile apps. That's computer vision on these kind of devices. I don't know if uh, how many of you have, uh, have seen any of the new Android tablets or have Android phones. Uh, but that's a, a big growing area for NVIDIA. I know most of the discussions here at SIGGRAPH focus around our professional solutions and our workstation solutions. This is, I think, the only talk where we're going to say anything about the mobile computing. But uh, hopefully by the end of this, you'll be pretty excited about that area of our business and some of the things we're doing there. Um, what we do is we look at this area of computer vision and we try to provide core algorithms that are optimized for our hardware that people can use and then work a lot with developers. So if there's anybody in the audience that is working in that vision or vision and graphics augmented reality area, um, we're eager to engage with you and learn what you want to do and see how we can help uh, enable you to bring your products to mobile devices on our Tegra platform. A um, little bit about uh, kind of the definition of, of computer vision from my perspective. I kind of look at it as the, uh, the inverse problem of computer graphics. And since this is a graphics con uh, conference, we'll start from that perspective. So in graphics, what you really do is you start with a three-dimensional model or some, some definition of the scene. It could be in geometry, and there are other procedural ways of describing a scene. But you, you know what the scene is. You've created that content or that definition of the scene. And then you want to create an image from it. Um, and that can be you know, of, of increasing complexity and realism uh, Throughout, uh, throughout the last couple decades. Um, computer vision is the opposite problem. You have an image. Uh, could be one image, could be multiple images, multiple views of the same scene, but you want to understand what is there. Um, it's a little bit different. Uh, I like to distinguish from image processing a little bit. Image processing is more about modifying the appearance of an image, things like color, sharp, or color enhancement, sharpening, contrast adjustment. It gets real sophisticated, noise reduction. But what I'm really talking about is trying to understand what's in the scene. Of course, those two disciplines go hand in hand um, as computer graphics and uh, computer vision go hand in hand. I know a lot of uh, researchers are in both, both fields. The, uh, one of the key observations here and how, why this is so relevant uh, and exciting for NVIDIA is that these are both massively parallel tasks. So the hardware that's needed for vision turns out to be, uh, the hardware that's needed for graphics, I'm sorry, turns out to be really ideal for computer vision in a lot of ways. Uh, when, I, uh, when I started before I came to NVIDIA, I was doing computer vision, needed uh, looking at higher performance processors and graphics processors were a real natural fit. That was right about the same time NVIDIA had started uh, introducing CUDA to make uh, um, our GPUs even more uh, programmable. Um, so there's, there's a clear benefit there. Um, in mobile devices, I think the thing that's changing in the exciting area uh, is how the mobile device is going to, the experience of a mobile device, you could say how a mobile device is going to change computer vision or how computer vision is going to change uh, a mobile device, but you're now going to have devices that become aware. So this device, to some extent, you know, GPS and accelerometers and the sensors will tell you a little bit about where you're at. But as vision gets more and more sophisticated, this thing's going to be able to know what's around it. And probably more interesting is going to be able to monitor the user. So almost all tablets have a user-facing camera now. All phones do so they can see, OK, wh who is the person that's using the device? Where are they looking? Uh, maybe what are their hands doing? It, it, you know, endless possibilities right now. We're just, this is all just beginning. Uh, so we don't completely know uh, know how that's going to evolve, but but think of kind of those two big areas of perception and interaction as being the the, uh, the exciting opportunities for using vision in mobile devices. Um, an area that I don't want to talk too much about because it's going to be Kari's half of this talk is going to be on smart photography or computational photography, and that's how we can use vision in an understanding of the scene to take a better photograph. Um, Obvious examples I've shown here is face detection. If you know where the face is, you can weight the exposure, focus the camera, et cetera, on the face. That's pretty obvious, but there's a whole lot more examples uh, that, that Kari will talk about, of, about how you can use vision and, and intelligence to improve, uh, improve your photograph. 
then as I alluded to earlier, uh, new applications, uh, they're just, you know, you go in the, uh, either the iTunes App Store for, for Apple devices or Android Market. There's all kinds of things. These, these, every couple weeks or every week we hear of a couple of these new things people are doing. Augmented reality is, is probably getting the most attention right now. And again, it's a graphics conference, so I'd expect to hear a lot about augmented reality here. And that's basically the blending of vision and graphics together, where you're taking the live image and then augmenting that with uh, some additional graphical content, um, and then you have to track objects. And the more sophisticated your vision algorithms are, the more compelling that augmented experience can be. Um, object recognition, that can be done both locally or on a server like Google Goggles does, and then gestural interfaces, kind of changing the way we interact with our device. And then another really big area, um, Tegra also has a, a very large presence in the automotive market. is one of the big areas we're uh, selling these devices to. And vehicle safety is one of the, the big holy grail applications for computer vision on these type of devices. Just because there's so, there's, you know, opportunity to save uh, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of lives a year um, by avoiding accidents, whether they've been pedestrians or vehicle-to-vehicle uh, -vehicle accidents. And there's just a, an overwhelming amount of research going on in this field. A lot of it is moving towards... Uh, GPU. Um, to kind of motivate you a little bit, I wanted to just show some numbers, uh, some sales and marketing numbers about the size of this market. When I was first asked to do uh, computer vision in mobile groups, uh, when I was at this conference last year, I was on the workstation side, and now I'm in the mobile side. Uh, I was a little nervous because here we're talking about a processor that's only one or two watts, and computer vision is hard with a thousand watts of power, and now we want to do it on these mobile devices. But what really sold me that this is uh, this is the area to, to to investigate and to put a lot of time in is the sheer volume of units. So if you look at the ramp of camera phones and how camera phones are displacing uh, regular uh, traditional digital cameras. Um, we're gonna we're close to a billion camera phones uh, sold every year. That means a lot of opportunities for computer vision apps. And when you have that device with you, wherever you are, the the opportunities to use this technology are endless. So, doing computer vision on a desktop is really cool. Doing it in a game console is really cool. Connect is uh, has shown uh, how exciting that can be. But when you're limited to that uh, confined environment, the applications are limited. When you get into a mobile device you have anywhere, you know, sky's the limit. Um, and the sales of these, uh, like I mentioned, approaching a billion, but what I wanted to also point out is not just the fact that the quantities of phones are increasing, and the quantities of cameras phones are increasing, but also the quality. And I know megapixels are not, more megapixels does not mean um, better image quality. I think uh, anybody that's looked closely will will know that uh, that's not necessarily true, but the point I do want to make is that the overall quality of the phone, whether or the overall quality of the camera, whether it's measured in megapixels or whether it's measured in by other metrics, is going up. So these camera phones are no longer junky, worthless cameras that really can't take anything that you'd ever want to post or ever want to share. These are getting to be really respectable, and that means that the opportunity to do some real computer vision is there as well. So again, just, you know, five megapixel is becoming about the norm for high-end smartphone. And then, again, just one more slide to show the growth of this market. Um, the bottom line shows kind of how, you know, desktop systems grew, the volume of PCs grew in its uh, early, early age. These are not the same years. These are just looking at the growth curve of these types of devices over the first 10 years. The rate of growth of smartphones is obviously you know, several times the rate of growth that PCs achieved back when they were first introduced in the 90s. So it is, a, it is an exciting area. Now let, let me uh, switch gears here and talk a little bit about the NVIDIA Tegra chip, which, again, probably most of the people here have not heard a whole lot about what we're doing in mobile, so I'll introduce this for the first time to some of you. Um, if you have heard, just uh, kind of bear with me, and we'll, we'll go into more of the specifics of computer vision in a minute. Um, 
the Tegra, Tegra is really a, an all-in-one application processor. It's an entire computer on a chip. So whereas for desktop systems, the GPU is a separate discrete chip that does graphics, it has some video stuff tied in, but it still requires a host CPU connected over PCI Express, Tegra is an all-in-one. We start with, uh, this is showing the Tegra 2 chip, which is shipping uh, in high volume today, the Samsung Galaxy tablet that I've got in my hand, a number of... Uh, phones in the market, like the Motorola Atrix, have this processor in it. Uh, it's a dual-core ARM Cortex-A9 CPU, uh, a GeForce GPU, so that's no surprise coming from NVIDIA, and then a whole bunch of other stuff uh, to make up the entire system. So the video, both uh, high-definition video encode and decode, is accelerated on chip, so very low power video capture uh, and playback. Um, audio uh, components there, and then all the peripherals. We have uh, you know the USBs, the display, the memory interface, the flash interfaces, PCI Express also for attaching other uh, devices in certain markets like automotive where we want to add some other system, other chips to the system, and then um, and then an image processor. So the the camera chips uh, or the image sensor chips actually hook directly to the Tegra chip and the Tegra chip has custom circuitry in there to do all of the demosaicing and all of the other color correction and sharpening and denoising that's required to actually get a good image off of a raw sensor chip. So it's all in, all in one single chip. Um, a comment on ARM, um, all of our focus in Tegra is on the ARM CPU. Again, that's quite different from the desktops. Um, but ARM is, it's the fastest growing and by far the most pervasious, pervasive uh, uh, CPU architecture on the market today, growing rapidly. If you look at, most people don't realize this, but due to the, the sales of mobile devices and other embedded devices, ARM cores actually outsell x86 cores by a factor of about 8 to 1 currently. That's not just future predictions, that's currently. Um, of course, x86, you know, in fairness, the, the revenue behind x86, they're much more expensive processors. ARM's cores range from, you know, a few dollars all the way up to, to tens of dollars for the more sophisticated ones using higher-end devices. But very, very popular. It's not some niche embedded processor that, you know, you need fancy expensive tools for and everything. It's a very, very mainstream, most uh, pervasive architecture in the world um, and continuing to grow, you know, faster than any architecture ever has. Um, I think I can add, um, this has you know, definitely be sh been shown publicly, is that uh, Microsoft has shown the next version of Windows is going to support ARM. And they've, uh, they've shown that now at a couple conferences. So um, whenever they decide to release that, you know, um, presumably sometime next year, you'll be able to choose between an ARM or an x86 CPU for your, for your PC or your mobile device. Um, and then Project Kalal, that is our next generation Tegra chip. Um, which we actually, it is not uh, just PowerPoint where this thing really exists. I've got one right here. I was going to, uh, maybe afterwards, I can, if people are interested, I can show some demos. We really don't have a way of projecting this onto the screen, but the, um, um, the, the Kalal chip is, uh, is similar in spirit to the Tegra 2. It's got a lot of the same functionality, CPU and GPU, but we make a couple of really big leaps. Uh, a very big leap in GPU processing power, so the graphics are pretty uh, stunning on this thing for a mobile device. And then um, we switch to a quad-core CPU. So CPU, and it's got, it's a more powerful quad-core, so we get more like a 5 to 6x gain in CPU horsepower. So by far the most powerful CPU available for a tablet or other mobile device. Uh, approximately 5x overall cap capability from what, uh, what we're shipping today with Tegra 2. And then a roadmap. Now, this is, you know, admittedly, this is kind of just a, a marketing slide that shows some code names of some of our processors uh, going out. We don't, we're not revealing a lot of the details of the architecture. But what I really want to highlight is sort of this relative performance gain that we expect to see. We're pretty confident that uh, that we'll be able to achieve. Um, and this is a, you know, this is exponential growth in processing power. So we are not, you know, mobile devices. The rate of processing power that you can expect to see on a phone or a tablet uh, in the next, you know, two to three years is is really jaw dropping. So don't don't be afraid to think big about what you're going to be able to do on a mobile device coming up. Okay, now switching gears a little bit, I want to talk about the software side and some of the tools we're making available. Uh, for computer vision on mobile devices. A lot of our effort right now is behind OpenCV, which I've heard already people talk about OpenCV in a couple other talks today, so I'm pretty sure that a lot of, uh, a lot of SIGGRAPH attendees know OpenCV well. It really, you could call it the OpenGL of computer vision. It's, 
the, uh, it is not yet uh, a Chrono standard like OpenGL is, um, but it is a kind of a de facto standard API that, um, that's been available, originally started by Intel uh, about a dozen or more years ago, um, but now is, a, is an open source project uh, that will, you know, hopefully will uh, be standardized, supporting an increasing a number of hardware and software platforms and operating systems. Um, like I said, it's been uh, about uh, 12 years. I did want to highlight you know, that it is a professionally developed library. This is not, when, when Intel um, stopped supporting it directly, it kind of sat in an open source, SourceForge project for a while and didn't get a lot of attention. But for the last several years, it's been funded by a number of companies. Um, there are, I'm going to, I don't know the exact count, but it's between 15 and 20 full-time professional developers that are working on this library as their full-time job, full test framework, you know, full build framework. So even though it is an open source project in that sense, don't get the impression that it's, you know, uh, something that a few people are working on as a part-time hobby project. This is a real professional software package. Over 3 million downloads. Um, and it's targeted for a couple different architectures originally, not surprisingly since it was uh, developed by Intel, it, it has got great support for SSE extensions on x86. Um, for the past year and a half, NVIDIA has been uh, supporting GPU uh, ports of it, and I'll talk a little bit about some of, the, some of the new stuff we're releasing. Just a quick overview of the functionality for those of you who may not uh, be familiar with OpenCV. Um, it does have the basic image processing stuff that I alluded to earlier, you know, scaling and sizing images and um, doing all the color adjustments and things you might want to do. But it's also got a whole bunch of uh, additional more computer vision functions from pattern recognition, pyramid generation, um, and then feature extraction and tracking, optical flow for tracking, uh, stereo support, camera calibration, and the list goes on and on. So and it, it's growing at a very rapid pace. There's a lot of new content put in there, as well as uh, you know continuing to optimize and bring what's there to more platforms. Um, this really isn't uh, directly applicable to the, the Tegra discussion right now, but I did want to point out that we have been supporting OpenCV for CUDA. Um, this work has uh, been going on for almost two years now. Um, it is not an NVIDIA product per se, although a lot of the code that there has been developed by NVIDIA engineers. Um, but it is out, uh, the OpenCV 2.3 release, which came out about a month ago, included the first final fully tested uh, version of the CUDA support. It's been in beta for quite a while that people have been able to get at it. Um, and then the functionality, this is just a, a bunch of bullets, I don't know if you can all read them, uh, but it, it shows, you know, we've really brought quite a bit of functionality uh, accelerated by the GPU. Our focus has been on those things that have been too slow on the CPU, so we wanted to bring new capability, things that weren't practical before, so we focused a lot on stereo vision and, and high-end uh, tracking and some, some classifiers like histogram and gradient, which are a little bit tedious on the CPU. Um, so that's out there today. Now what I'm talking about mobile is more on the Android side. So let's talk about, uh, for those of you not familiar with Android, I'm sure you've all heard of it. It is uh, the fastest growing operating system ever, and currently it's about 39% of the smartphone market uh, is Android based. It has surpassed uh, iOS to become the, the dominant operating systems for smartphones in the market today. Largely supported uh, by Google, as uh, I'm sure everybody's aware of. What we've been uh, working on for the past several months is bring OpenCV to Android. So now that same library that's available on x86 um, processors and Windows, Mac, uh, and Linux is now also available on Android, optimized for ARM processors. Um, the links are here. Actually, the 2.3.1 release, which uh, includes the first version of the Android uh, support, is due to be released today. The beta's out there. Um, it's been out there for about a month. Now, I went, just before the talk, I went online and I didn't actually see the link to it, so it might not have actually been posted yet. I may uh, be making a liar out of myself, but at least the plan is that sometime today it, uh, it will, in fact, be released. Um, and what that means is now we have OpenCV um, support on Tegra for Android, uh, accelerated for ARM and, and Neon. So it is, you know, the world's most popular computer vision library on the fastest growing OS on the world's most popular uh, uh, processor architecture. If you're interested in, uh, in doing some Android development, I wanted to, uh, to point out one, 
one frustration a lot of people have with Android is, is the development environment includes a lot of different pieces from different places, and now we're adding yet another piece with OpenCV. If you go to NVIDIA's uh, developer website, we do have this Tegra developer pack, which is basically an all-in-one installer that brings together all the tools you need to do Android development into one place, into one installer. It's a big package. It takes a good hour to install. But uh, if anybody out here has gone through the pain of trying to, you know, if you don't already use Eclipse, you got to go get that. You got to go get the Java development tools. We've brought that all into one, uh, one simple to use, um, one simple to use package here. So I'd encourage you, if you're interested in trying this out, to go to our website and and download the development pack to get sta started. Um, a quick note about uh, Android applications before I, I just want to say a few things about the, uh, the development of OpenCV apps uh, on Android. The typical way people write Android applications is in Java. Uh, so it includes, Android includes a Java compiler and a, and a special, uh, really lightweight uh, Java runtime engine that uh, they developed, Google developed, called Dalvik which is uh, kind of like the Java runtime engine that, that runs on PCs, but it's really optimized for mobile devices. Um, so the typical way that you as a developer would write an app is you'd write Java code, compile it down to byte code, and then it would run on uh, the Java runtime, the Dalvik engine would run it on the native hardware. Um, another way to write apps on Android is uh, to write native applications. So you can write C and C++ code, compile it for Android and run it on the device natively, and then you just wrap that in Java calls. And then you can make like one Java call that starts your app and everything else can be in, in C and C++ and you can optimize that for your, uh, for your hardware. One of the big efforts that we did in supporting uh, OpenCV and Android is give you both options. Um, so OpenCV until now has been a C, C and C, more recently, uh, it's primarily a C++ API now. Um, but that meant that if you wanted to use OpenCV on Android, you'd have to do this native code thing, which admittedly is a lot tougher than just using the standard Java tools. Uh, so we went through the work of creating a full Java API to OpenCV. Um, and now you can, in fact, just use, uh, just use the standard, just like any other app. Uh, I'll show you a code example in, in just a second here. Uh, makes it real easy to start using OpenCV. If you are a computer vision developer and you actually have your own algorithms you want to add and you want to you know, access pixels at a low level and do a lot of optimization yourself, you absolutely can go and still write native code and take advantage of you know, the ARM's assembly language and the neon vector units in the ARM and all that kind of stuff. That's, we haven't taken any of that away, but what we have done is given you the choice. If you just want to use OpenCV without creating your own low-level tools, um, you can just use the, the Java API directly. And as an example of that, you know, if you're a Java developer, you'll recognize you just have an import uh, keyword for adding a library uh, into, you know, for the, it's, it's the equivalent of including a header file in C or C++. Um, and there's a bunch of the OpenCV packages that are just uh, imported with the keyword. And then you can go ahead and, uh, okay, now I'm nervous because there's a power strip here that I thought was charging my laptop and is not. Um, so I am about, I need to find a, an outlet real quick. Do you know where we've got an outlet? The outlet strip on here is not working and my laptop's about to die. <laughs> I thought it was working, so if you can, okay. Sorry about that, but the last thing I want to have is have this go blank right in the middle of the talk. And we are good now. Okay. Um, so, yeah, once you've included the OpenCV package, then uh, you can just start using. These are the same functions that you would have in the C library of OpenCV you now have in the, uh, in the Java API. Again, this is just uh, Java code for, um, for a, a simple uh, Android Java app. And boom, all the stuff is, is immediately available. Um, so that's, you know, that's kind of the summary. I, a couple of uh, acknowledgments I want to point out. A lot of the development of OpenCV, we've got two partners that we work with quite closely. Uh, Willow Garage is a robotics company in Menlo Park, California. They are kind of the official maintainers of OpenCV. Um, Gary Bradsky is the founder of OpenCV. He was originally in Intel, and he's with Willow Garage. So they're a really close partner and have been uh, instrumental in helping bring a lot of this to, um, uh, to fruition. And then ITSEES is a uh, computer vision company in Russia that is doing a lot of the OpenCV development with us. So 
they're a very good partner. So I definitely uh, wanted to thank them for their continued support and development work. And then finally, I wanted to make uh, just point out one other organization that uh, is brand new for anybody interested in vision on mobile devices and other embedded devices, and that is the Embedded uh, Vision Alliance. Um, this is a lot of resources for people that are interested in computer vision on mobile devices, just embeddedvision.com. And you can see uh, this slide shows a bunch of the founding members of that organization, NVIDIA being one of the founding, founding members. Again, the goal of this organization is to promote computer vision. Um, so if you're interested in, in this field, that's a great resource uh, beyond some of the other things I talked about. So with that, I think uh, my time is about up. Um, Kari, you want to go ahead? And then at the very end, if there's leftover time, I'll take questions. But I don't want to take away from Kari's time because we lost a few minutes in the beginning. So now we will jump over to your uh, play from start. Do you have the mic or do you need this one? Okay. All right. Thanks, Joe. So, hello, everybody. My name is Kari Pulli. Uh, I'm Fairly new uh, at NVIDIA, I've been there now four months. Uh, before that, I worked at uh, Nokia Research. And uh, this was a project that I worked there and uh, together with Stanford. And this is something I kind of brought uh, to NVIDIA with me. So uh, Joel talked about computer vision. Computer vision is about enabling machines to see, uh, whereas uh, photography is for people to see. I mean, the idea is to get pictures, share them, look at them. Uh, the pictures should look good. They should be nice. And uh, you kind of uh, use them for telling stories. So it's kind of art form. Uh, and also you use them for recording events, kind of throw away thing, look, look what I saw, post it on the Facebook or something. So with computational photography, you try to overcome limitations of traditional cameras. So uh, And often you do this by taking several images, and then you combine those images, and you tease out some information. You get over some deficiencies uh, and uh, create better images. Sometimes you even change the camera uh, to uh, kind of um, try to get those better images. But in the past, it's mostly been done in the labs uh, by researchers and uh, professionals and under conditions that are very controlled. Like uh, the cameras on a tripod, the uh, targets are immovable objects. And using high-end cameras that have very uh, nice uh, optics and sen uh, sensors, and uh, then the processing is done later offline on a PC. Uh, then here are some uh, applications uh, that people have done with computational photography. One is high dynamic range imaging, the idea being that uh, you can take in this kind of church situation several images with different uh, settings, but none of them are really good because you can't at the same time capture the dark parts and the really bright parts. So what you can do is you take many images and then kind of merge them into a single image that shows all the details. Another example is that you extend the um, field of view, you take several of these uh, small views and then you stitch them together to panoramas. Or in this case, uh, there's a person uh, sitting in front of the window and if you don't use flash, you don't see what's going on inside. If you use the flash, you get the reflections, but uh, combining those can give you better images. Uh, this is pretty cool application. Uh, it uh, modifies the camera so that uh, there's the regular sensor and there's small array, well, there's an array of really small lenses in front of the sensor. And what you, what you get is that um, you kind of record different directions of light. And then as a post-processing, you can then um, refocus the image after the fact and focus that at different distances. Or uh, in this contraption, um, uh, the camera was kind of wired together with uh, sensors so that you can figure out how the camera moves as you take the image. And then uh, this blurry image can be de-blurred if you know exactly how the camera moves. So uh, with mobile computational photography, uh, the idea was that we would like to take uh, the, all these cool applications from the labs and bring them, make them available to everybody. And that means using camera phones. 
And now camera phones have uh, posed some new challenges. The optics are much smaller than on big uh, DSLRs. Uh, the sensors are much more, uh, smaller. That means more noise. Uh, the devices are handheld. You do, typically do not carry a tripod to uh, hold your cell, uh, camera phone with. Um, so you have to take that into account. And we want to make the uh, process online, meaning interactive, so that there should be interactive loop between the user, kind of uh, seeing, uh, aiming, trying, seeing what the result might be. And then if it's not quite uh, to your liking, you do it again, and then share the results immediately. When we started working on this and implementing these computational photography applications on cell phones, um, then there were some problems. And the first problem was that the uh, APIs were not very expressive. Uh, they, they did not give you the access that you would uh, require for this sophisticated uh, algorithm. So, no direct access to sensor, or lens, or flash. There's this control loop that uh, basically tries to do everything for you. It tries to be really smart. It's called 3A, uh, um, uh, like auto exposure, auto focus, um, auto white balance. It tries to figure out which parameters should be used for this image. But those are precisely the uh, parameters that you want to control yourself if you kind of try to be smarter than the camera originally was. Uh, also, the settings are limited, and sometimes you only get relative settings. So, okay, we think this is good. You, you, you are able, uh, able to maybe nudge it up or down, but uh, we don't even tell you what the numerical value is going to be. So, but this kind of routines, they are enough to write a point-and-shoot application, but not really these sophisticated ones. Uh, it's fairly easy to change if the manufacturers want to give that uh, uh, access. And uh, that's already starting to happen. There is something called CHDK, the scanner, uh, Canon Hack uh, SDK. Uh, what's, you, you might think that's kind of similar what we were after, but that really only allows you to script your camera. So under a pro program control, you can do those things that you could do manually from the menus and so forth. But what it doesn't allow you to do is to change those algorithms, this auto exposure and auto white balance and all, all those. We wanted to do that. But then once we kind of got past that, we noticed that there's another problem, uh, which is the, uh, that uh, most people, when they write camera APIs, they kind of have a wrong mental model for the camera, how it works. So the traditional model that, uh, is that there is a single state with a camera. So there are all these parameters that you can, uh, uh, can uh, uh, apply. And then the idea is that, OK, I just apply them, and then I take an image, and everything just works. But it's not quite like that, because uh, the, like the graphics pipeline, the image processing pipeline is also a pipeline. So here's the sensor part, and already the sensor is a pipeline. While you're taking the current image, at the same time you're configuring the next image, and at the same time, you're reading out the previous image. And then there's the post-processing pipeline, imaging pipeline, that uh, also does various things. And everything runs at the same time. So now if you go and change some of those parameters, and you think that you change them atomically, what happens is that you actually might be affecting different images. And that's no good. Uh, of course, there's the, uh, other possibilities that um, uh, you then reset the pipeline when you want to change any of these, but that means that you have to wait until all the previous images come out. Then you can reset, and then you can restart. And that costs time, and time is actually important when you take images of, for example, people. So here's a kind of HDR stack of this person and the second image, and all right, you can see already something is wrong. And like things happen. And uh, if you wait long enough, things happen. And uh, from this kind of input, you get that kind of output. That was probably not what you had in mind. So uh, together with um, Nokia and Stanford and a couple of other people, we kind of developed this FCAM architecture, uh, originally short for Franken camera. Uh, I also like to think of it as functional or flexible camera. So it's a software architecture for programmable cameras. The idea is to really give the capabilities of hardware 
available to programmers in an easy way. So um, the sensor is at the core of the system, so we recognize it's a pipeline, and it does not have a, mo a global state. Instead, the state lives in these requests, which we call shots. So you can think of it as a structure. It's basically all these parameters that you want to have uh, bundled into a single thing, and that state travels through the pipeline so that then you can have different states in consecutive images and things hopefully work like you meant them to. Uh, then we have this image processor, uh, ISP image single processor. What it usually does is does this post-processing, but uh, for us it has two important tasks. One is uh, just get away and don't do anything. If we, if we want to get the raw images, not processed, uh, we should be able to do that. That's one requirement. Another thing that's handy to have is to have these st statistics, for example, histograms or sharpness measures. They help us to uh, write our own versions of these uh, 3A algorithms. Because, uh, for example, we don't have to analyze in our program the whole image to figure out the level of uh, illumination. If we get the histogram of the image, then we can do the processing much faster. Then we have other devices, typical ones, uh, lens or flash. And we have these actions, and that's actually a mechanism for synchronization. So we can have things happen during the exposure uh, so that we know when they happen. So for example, flash should be synchronized quite accurately with the exposure. It doesn't help much if the flash goes off before or after the exposure, useless. Uh, other examples that the programmer could create their own devices might be a player for uh, playing the click sound when you press the shutter button. And uh, yeah, as a sum summary, the idea is that the programmer has full control over sen uh, sensor settings and uh, there's no hidden demon kind of changing values under you without even telling you about it. Uh, as of last year, there were two implementations of this uh, architecture. This is the Franken Camera version, uh, version 2.0, uh, developed at Stanford. And uh, this is the Nokia N900 Linux-based smartphone. Now, uh, what we started uh, doing at uh, NVIDIA is that we have this uh, developer board that, uh, well, Joe just uh, showed, <coughs> and uh, we are porting FCAM on that. FCAM is an open source project. Uh, just Google it up, fcam.garage.mimo.org. Uh, all the source code is there. There's documentation. There's getting started uh, in instructions. OK, so we have, uh, there's uh, also kind of sample application that's provided. It's called FCamera. And uh, the idea with the FCamera is that it kind of gives you a rough implementation of a complete camera application with all the source codes. And uh, we also give um, kind of three sample algorithms for this 3A that you can use as a basis for your own more uh, specialized uh, algorithms. So one is the exposure metering. So the idea is that, uh, well, there's usually like if this is the scene intensity, and this is the kind of intensity of the pixels that you get. The, there's some kind of nonlinear curve, usually, um, what the ISP uh, does for the processing, uh, for, for the image. And what we want to do with this auto exposure is we want to kind of move this curve back and forth to some, some level. So this would be kind of a fairly normal setting. If we move it to the left, we get darker image. If we move it to the right, we get brighter image. And we have these two parameters, uh, Y and P, that we give. So here's an example. If we want to get the highlights really well, uh, we could set uh, this so that the meaning that half percent, uh, top half percent of the pixels should be um, roughly like 0 0.9 uh, if, the, if the intensity values go from 0 to 1. So then you would get, with this settings, you would get something like that. Then uh, this is the one where you would get, uh, want to get the shadows. So we want to get the details in the dark part. So we want to say that the darkest 10% of the images should have uh, the intensity value of 0 0.1. 
And this, uh, if you use something like this, you would get uh, kind of fairly typical auto exposure uh, parameters. We also support auto white balance, meaning that uh, if if uh, if this is uh, an image that you would take, you you kind of see that it's bluish, um, doesn't look very good. Your eye does not see that when you when you are in the environment, your eye kind of adapts to the illumination. Uh, the same scene looks like this. And the idea is that we want to get this kind of image, it's not that kind of image. So how do we do that? There are several ways. Um, what we do is uh, we use this gray world assumption. We kind of assume that things are on the average gray, or even if they are not, kind of the colors are evenly distributed. So. Um, what we do, we have kind of pre-calibrated some of the illumination levels, and we transform the image to one and uh, to another kind of color temperature. And then we figure out how do we need to interpolate between those two color temperatures to balance the different values. And then we actually only balance red and blue. And that's the... And then finally, there's the autofocus algorithm, so it basically works like that. So you just try different focal settings, and uh, so you move the lens, and then you analyze the sharpness of the image. And how do we analyze the sharpness? We just take like differences of the neighboring pixels. If it's sharp, then the differences are likely to be bigger than if it's blurred, then the neighboring pixels have very similar uh, intensity values. Here are a couple of applications that we developed on, uh, on FCAM. Uh, first is this HDR, it's the prototypical example. We actually made a shortcut, kind of simplified HDR uh, called exposure fusion. Uh, uh, the algorithm wasn't our invention, it was published previously at Pacific Graphics. Uh, the idea is that if we have these three images here, uh, all of them are kind of faulty in some sense, but all of them have some pixels that are quite good. So for example, in this, uh, the foreground is, is quite well um, visible. Here the background, the sky is really uh, pretty. And uh, th this, this one has detail on some uh, middle um, levels of intensity. So we have these weight maps that we kind of f uh, figure out and uh, so the idea is that from this image, we take the foreground, from that image, the sky, and some of the medium parts here. And uh, we have these various uh, heuristics to figure out how do we uh, calculate the weight. So if the, if the contrast is high, we probably want to use that value. If, the, if its uh, intensity is too high or too low, we probably don't want to, uh, that pixel and so forth. But if we would now then just make a blending of these images using this um, uh, weights, we would get uh, garbage. So we have this kind of smarter hierarchical way of combining the, uh, that, that uh, completely hides any seams that you might otherwise get. Uh, this was implemented on the N900. Um, here's an example scene that was actually done with uh, FCAM. And uh, if, you, if you would buy this uh, Nokia N900, uh, uh, this is one of the applications that you can download. Uh, another application that we uh, wrote also that's also available for download is low light imaging. So the problem is that if you, t if you don't have enough photons, if it's too dark and your sensor is not sensitive enough and the optics uh, is not good enough, then there's kind of two kinds of poisons that you can choose which one you like more. So do you like the noise or do you like the blur? Well, both of these have kind of complementary characteristics that you might want to use. So our solution is that we actually take two images and try to combine them. So if this is the kind of path of the camera that uh, there's some handshake as you hold it. So if you take a short exposure, then you get this noisy image. And if you take the long one, then you get the blurry image. The noisy image is sharp, so that's the good part. This one has good colors. So in the areas that are not, uh, have, uh, uh, do not have uh, much detail, then we get better information here. 
So then we can uh, use the complementary information. And uh, here's an example. This is from Stanford Memorial Church. This is the noisy image. This is the blurry image. And when we combine, we can get something that's much better. Uh, that's not the only way of uh, taking images if you don't uh, have so uh, enough photons otherwise. So you could just try. You can set the exposure time uh, long enough. And as long as the scene doesn't move too much, you can try to just hold the camera really steady. Well, that's difficult. But it's not impossible. If you try several times, maybe you get lucky and you, you can get one of the good images. So rather than have, uh, forcing the user to kind of press and check and press and check, it's just the user presses once. And uh, we attach this uh, gyro to the camera. And then we look at the paths, uh, signals that the gyro tells. And if, if, if it's shaky, well, the image is likely to be shaky. We just throw those images away. And once we get one image where the camera is kind of steady enough, then we can keep that. And uh, yet another application that kind of demonstrates uh, this uh, synchronization capabilities of the API. So here's the Franken camera with two flashes. And uh, when you throw, uh, throw up the cards, uh, one, uh, one of these uh, kind of goes on and off really quickly and uh, records the path of the cards. And then this other, uh, towards the end of the exposure, this one uh, goes off with a much brighter flash, and then that kind of freezes the motion of the, of the cards in the end. The F camera has also been used at several courses. The first one was at Stanford. Um, and the first assignment was this autofocus. And uh, the interesting thing was that the students had, had one week time uh, for doing uh, this task. And it's. That would normally be just way too cruel a task uh, to give. But uh, if, if you have good tools, you can get good results. And every team uh, was able to get a working autofocus algorithm running on a phone, on a camera phone, in one week. And uh, some of them were actually even better than the built-in autofocus ones in the sense that they were fairly robust and converged to a good solution faster. So no, uh, you think that that's kind of embarrassing for the camera engineers that had worked for several many years on it. But uh, I'd say that it only shows that if you have good tools, you can get good things done faster. Uh, another project from the same course was uh, a borrowed flash. So this is the normal situation where the flash is close to the camera. And you take a, a picture of a person, then you get this reflectance from the retina, and you get the red eye. You can fix that by moving the flash away from the camera so you don't get the reflectance then to the camera. But uh, there's no room in a cell phone uh, which is this size, so it just doesn't match. Well, OK, if you have another one, you can borrow the flash. And then the question is, can you synchronize them? Well, uh, the API allowed uh, those cameras to be synchronized even over Bluetooth. Uh, uh, w well enough so that this was actually possible to do. This is a final application. This this kind of like uh, application for uh, trick Im imagery. So the idea is that you can take uh, images and then in the viewfinder you kind of see part of the previous image as you're composing the new image. So you can create these uh, images like sitting and having a chat with your identical twin even if you don't happen to have one or holding yourself levitating in, in midair. Uh, so I mentioned that uh, we have started developing FGAM or porting FGAM on, on Tegra. Uh, so the, the new developer board, it's, it's pretty nice for camera stuff. It has uh, one front-facing camera, like a, uh, HD video uh, size camera. There's two cameras on the back side, uh, five megapixel cameras. So you can do stereo stuff there as well. And uh, I have a video clip of showing kind of the babe, kind of first tries with, uh, with Tegra. So this is from our uh, co coffee break room. So that's, a, that's the tablet. Uh, there's the, it's a live viewfinder. 
and uh, when, when that button was pressed, it captured a stack of uh, images with the, uh, different exposures. It, uh, here's a sequence of images that was taken when I was, I was standing there, so there's the kind of more and more light coming into the picture. And then uh, this is the exposure fusion image out of those input images. These uh, Tegra developer boards, they are still kind of rare, uh, even internally. But they are starting to be available soon. And uh, what we are doing now is we are kind of ga uh, gathering research ideas. and. Uh, we have this kind of call for uh, research proposals. If you have a project um, that is suitable for mobile computer vision or computational photography, uh, where you could think you could benefit from a device or this kind of form factor and OpenCV and FCAM support, uh, tell us. Um, there's a website that uh, looks like that. It kind of tells more details about the Tegra. And uh, you can put your contact information and project description. And uh, then if, uh, if we think the uh, idea was cool enough, then uh, maybe you'll get a prize. So there's a web website there. It's the Tegra project. You, you, can, you just go to research.h 